If you were around and online for the 80s, 90s, or 2000s, you could almost certainly make a dial-up modem noise with your mouth. It's just a fact. I'm not going to, but I could if I wanted to. That's because you used to have to actually do something to go from offline to online. You had to dial up with your modem, and everyone who had that experience just kind of etched it into their head, this feeling of going from not connected to connected. Whether because of that nostalgia, the feeling of the unlimited potential of logging on that we used to have before the internet became a cesspool, or for other more practical reasons, you might want to use a modem in this foul year of our Lord 2020. Besides nostalgia for the experience of dialing up in the 90s, you might have nostalgia for the experience of dialing up in the 80s, when instead of connecting to the internet, you were connecting to a Unix system or something like that. You might also have devices that can't really be networked at all without the use of a modem. There's a couple things out there I can't name them off the top of my head. They don't have ethernet, they don't have memory card slots, there's no way to get data on or off of them other than through a modem port. And finally, maybe you never did it back in the day. Maybe you didn't have internet connection, maybe you were too young, and you'd like to know now what all the hubbub was about. For all these reasons and more, you might have thought about getting a couple modems and trying to get them to talk to each other, uh, but known that there were issues with that, that it's not as simple as simply buying two modems and plugging them together with a cable. Now, maybe you know that's not possible, or maybe you just assume it must not be possible, but either way, you're right, it's not. You can't just plug two modems together with a cable and have them work. Now, to head off the inevitable comments, yes, I know what I just said is not strictly true. There are a lot of modems that support a feature where you can tell the modem to just assume there's another modem connected to it, not look for dial tone, not send digits, just connect straight through, and I haven't really looked into that feature very much. The reasons for that are first that I tried it and I couldn't get it to work, Secondly, that I've been told it doesn't work on some modems, which is probably why I couldn't get it to work on mine. Also, in my experience, there's devices and programs that don't play ball with this sort of approach. You have to send special commands to the modem to put it into the right mode, and a lot of programs expect to send the dialing string themselves. They demand you put in a phone number and won't take no for an answer, so they just can't be told to put the modem into the right state for this to work. But finally, and most importantly to me, I just think it's super boring. I mean, it just seems pointless to me. If I'm going to have a connection between two computers without having to go through the whole proper process of dialing up and connecting, then why don't I just use a null modem cable? So for all those reasons, I didn't look into that very hard. Okay, so how do you get a phone line? Well, the simplest way to do it is to get a phone line. You just go to your local phone company and order one, but you're going to pay like 30, 40 bucks a month. And if you're going to dial from one modem to another, you're going to need two phone lines. Nobody wants to pay 60 to $80 a month just to futz around with their old computers at home once in a while, so that's not really a winner. Okay, so suppose you want to make a fake telephone line. Well, phone lines are pretty complex objects. They do a lot of stuff. Telephone line has to produce 48 volts DC power, uh, a bunch of different tones, including dial tone, ringback tone, busy signal. It has to recognize dial digits and then complete the call once a certain time has elapsed. It has to produce 90 volts AC ringing signal at the far end, and then it has to monitor the line to know when either of the two ends is hung up. You could build something that simulates that as a hobbyist, I'm sure, but it's not going to be easy or straightforward or cheap. You can buy commercial devices that do this called telephone line simulators, but they're usually pretty expensive, like a couple hundred bucks or more, and kind of large and complex, so it's, it's all way too much for this. What you want is something small, easy to configure, and inexpensive, and I've got just the device for you. The device that I use for this is a Cisco SPA122 voice over IP analog telephone adapter. There's a few other devices that can do this, but this one is readily available and very inexpensive. The purpose of this and other ATAs is to allow you to connect conventional telephone devices to a voice over IP phone network. This is a Polycom VVX410, I think, voice over IP phone, and, uh, it's not really a telephone in the sense that this guy here is. Like this, this is just like a Sony phone from 1992 or whatever. And if you plug this into a phone line, you'll get dial tone when you pick it up, right? The only thing this contains is a speaker, a microphone, and a way to generate digits. That's it. This guy, on the other hand, despite being phone shaped, is not really a phone in the sense that that is. This is a computer running, I think Linux actually, and it's essentially um, Skype in a box. I can pick up the phone and I get a dial tone and I can dial but those digits aren't going anywhere. The phone's not connected to anything when I do that. It's generating that dial tone internally with software, and it's generating the digits themselves as well. And then when I actually hit the dial button, it generates a UDP network packet and sends it down the ethernet to wherever I'm calling. So you can configure these things to talk amongst themselves on a local network, but if you want to be able to call out to normal telephones, which most people do, you have to pay an internet telephony service provider for a service which converts your voice over IP calls into conventional telephone network calls. 
The purpose of the ATA is to handle the opposite situation. Not how do you get a VoIP phone to talk to a conventional phone, but how do you get a conventional phone to talk to a VoIP network? So if you look at the back here, you'll see there's two ordinary telephone jacks and then your ethernet jacks. So what this guy does is it produces a facsimile of a phone line on these two ports here. It produces the voltage and the dial tone and all that. And then when you plug a telephone into it and dial, it receives the digits, translates them into a voice over IP call and sends them out to the internet. It's essentially the back half of a VoIP phone that turns your voice into a stream of packets and whatnot without the front part, the handset and the dial pad and everything. Now this device is less intended for hooking up ordinary telephones, although those do work just fine, and more for devices that operate over the phone system but are unlikely to ever be updated for voice over IP, such as fax machines, credit card terminals, and modems. If you were to get ITSP service for this thing, you could plug your modem into it and dial up to anybody else in the world who has a modem, or you could even dial up to a dial-up ISP. Those still exist. The problem, again, is you'd be paying a monthly fee for this, and who wants to do that for just messing around at home with their old computers? I have a configuration on my website, which I'll link in the description, that explains how to configure this device to call directly between its own two ports. You plug your first modem in here, your second one in here, you dial a bogus phone number from either one of them, the other port rings, they pick up, and it's just like they're on a real phone line. That's possible because this device is basically as intelligent as an entire telephone network switch. It just only has two lines coming out of it. So because of that intelligence, we'll be able to call between our two modems with no external services, and we don't have to pay any money to anybody. Let me show you. Let's just get old and busted out here. Okay, I got my Pentium 1 laptop, my Pentium 3 laptop. Their modems are both connected together through the ATA. I've got Doom 95 running on both, and I'm going to make a call. And there we are. There's Doom. Here's the other guy. It's running absolutely dog slow because that Pentium uh, running Doom 95 really can't quite handle it. But if I reach over here and fire, I get injured over here. So we're playing Doom over dial up 1994 style. And now having demonstrated that, I'm going to shut off this other machine because that hard drive is so loud. Oh, it's so much better. Now I configured this device to call between its own two ports, so you can use it with two computers that are in the same room. But you can easily reconfigure this to call another device at a different IP address, which allows you to put it somewhere else in your house, on your LAN, or at somebody else's house. If you're in the US and you know somebody in Germany who has one of these configured with the appropriate router port forward, you can have an international doom death match, an experience that probably nobody had in 1984. At the per minute rates of the time, you would have paid like $300 for that deathmatch. Now with that said, playing games is probably uh, the less common desire that most people watching this have. What you probably want to do more likely is to get a computer on the internet. Maybe you got a machine like this Dell here that has a built-in modem but no built-in ethernet and you don't want to go rustle up a card bus card just to get it online. Or maybe you've got like a classic Mac where you can get an ethernet card but they're rare and expensive. As long as you're not worried about speed, this is a reasonable way to get either of those machines on the internet if you just want to dink around. This is a little more complex because you need a second machine to act as the ISP in this relationship. It's got to have a modem and also an interface to your modern network. If you're looking for an endorsement, I can't recommend the Dell Latitude E6420 for this purpose enough. It's one of the latest machines I'm aware of that has a built-in modem. Now, of course, you don't need anything this powerful. You can do it on anything that will run Windows Server or Linux. Uh, in fact, there's a guide that I link from my documentation on how to do this with a Raspberry Pi, but I can't get it to work, so I wanted to give you the procedure that works for me. I use Windows Server for my dial-up gateway because I just find it a little more consistent. I find diagnosing things on Linux to be infuriating, whereas Windows Server has worked very well for me. Okay, now that that's booted, I can just close the screen here. So I configured this with Windows Remote Routing and Access Services, and now I can just go dial up to the internet. And we're handshaking. Right now it's authenticating with the user I built on here, and it's now getting an IP address, and for some reason this step just takes eons. It takes like five solid minutes. It takes so long to connect, my screensaver activated. All right, and finally we're connected. You can open up Internet Explorer here, and we can wait a very, very, very long time because it'll never connect to msn.com. Oh, oh my god, it actually loaded. Every time I've tried to do this, this webpage just sat here for 10 minutes and never loaded. Great, I can get my coronavirus news right here on my Pentium 3. Ah, there we go, this experience needs a newer generation of browser. 
this experience is generally what you're going to have using an old machine like this because uh, TLS and modern JavaScript and so on aren't supported by anything you can run on a machine of this vintage. Nonetheless, if you can find any resources that are hosted on plain HTTP and don't require any of those new technologies, uh, they'll load just fine on here. Here, for instance, is a page on my website that I configured to not require HTTPS, so I can actually get to it on here, and it loads just fine. And in fact, this is one of the primary purposes I have for bothering with the whole dial-up shenanigan. If I want to move a 30 megabyte file onto this machine, which I've had to do before, I don't want to have to swap out 30 disks to do it. The dial-up connection might be slow, but I can just park it over in the corner and let it do its thing and come back to it in a couple hours whenever it's done, rather than having to sit there and feed it new disks every couple minutes. So for instance, I've just got like an ISO over here I use for file download tests, right? And this starts out saying it's gonna take uh, an hour plus to download 40 megabytes, but it's accelerating. All right, now we're down to less than 45 minutes to download this 40 meg file over a 33.6 modem, uh, which is pretty impressive, but that's because it's going at 15 kilobytes per second, which seems wild for a 33.6 connection. Turns out, and I didn't know this until recently, that ISP to subscriber compression was really common on dial-up connections in order to get better throughput. So as the data from the server hits the ISP's gateway, they compress it, send it down to my machine, and then it decompresses it. The ISP gateway being this laptop here. But now something that might be bugging you is, why am I only connected at 336? Both these machines have 56K modems in them. Why am I not getting a 56K connection? If the dial-up handshake sequence sounded a little different than you remember, that might be why. You might be remembering a 56K handshake, whereas this is only doing a 336 handshake. Now, 56K was all over the place, and both these machines have 56K modems. Why aren't we getting the full throughput? You don't really need the full throughput for just messing around like this, but still, you'd like it. What's the deal? Well, I don't have time in this video to go into all the theory of why it doesn't work, but I can save you time by telling you don't try to make it work. It's never going to happen. The V90 and V92 specifications that define 56K actually say that this type of modem and the type that's in here and in here are incapable of originating a 56K data stream. They're only capable of receiving it. These modems talking to each other can only do 33.6 by design. The reasons behind that are really complex and require a bunch of theory and understanding of how the telephone network works, so I'm still working on how to condense that into a format that'll work in a video so I can explain it to you without going way overboard. I do intend to do it though in hopefully the near future along with uh, a couple other videos I'm planning about other modem technologies. It turns out there's a whole bunch of wild stuff that modems did that most people, even people who were there, don't remember was possible. If you haven't already, uh, if you go ahead and subscribe, it'll let me know that you're interested in seeing more stuff like this. And if you want to throw me a couple bucks to help me afford some of the equipment to demonstrate some of this technology, that would be even better. There's links in the description where you can do that. But that's all I got to show you today because this isn't a very visually interesting subject. I mean, hey, the modem connected. It's not like you can see how it's doing it. I mostly just wanted to let everybody know that I'd made guides on how to do this, which you can find, again, in the description. If you do anything cool with this technique, it'd be neat to let me know about it in the comments. But other than that, uh, thanks for watching. I'm sure I did enough takes of that.